Hello and welcome to another action-packed, exciting hour of the Smoky Mountain Wrestling Rewatch Along Project. This is podcasting the way it used to be and the way you like it. This show is a production of the Something Else Podcasting Network, and it is episode number 067 of Smoky Mountain Wrestling from May 8th, 1993, taped April 19th, 1993, at the Knox Central High School in Barberville, Kentucky. My name is Aria, and welcome to the show. And of course, joining me as he does each and every week on this very program is the Scott Armstrong to my Dixie Dino Might. It's Trey. Uh, I thought you might say the dog catcher to your U.S. Senator. The dog catcher to my U.S. Senator. <laughs> it's Trey. What's happening? Ah, not a whole golden boatload today. How about you? Uh, I don't know. Tommy hurts, kind of. Sucks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So if I if, if I suddenly uh if I suddenly say I have to go right now, please excuse me. No, you must bring the uh, headset and the microphone in with you to uh, the bathroom. My heads, my uh, microphone is wired. It was funny. I was, I had that thought. I was just on a, uh, a training thing for work, and I'm like, "What am I going to do if something happens?" But it didn't. Um. So we have uh, some uh, wacky news here. Now we used to do a segment right. called Weird News of the Week. That was when the show used to last like thirty minutes, and I just needed stuff to uh, pad the runtime. But uh, my friend Steph just sent me something, and I'm reading this without I'm reading this on air without reading it ahead of time. So this could be total crap or it could be total gold here. But this is from the Standard Speaker, which is the newspaper in Hazleton, Pennsylvania, and it says a 39 year old man who eluded police after being tased by squeezing under a guardrail, rolling down a hill, running through an old amusement park, and swimming across Nescapec Creek, finally was caught two hours, 45 minutes later after a drone spotted his hiding place. Holy shit. Wow. That's a lot. I, and I'm sitting at like, 39. I wonder if I went to high school with him, but it only shows uh, me the, uh, it only shows me like, uh, the screenshot of that. Uh, I'm going to text my friend who was it to, if we went to high school with them. Oh, please give us an update when you find out. Yes. Uh, all right. So in case, by the way, this is the first time you've ever listened to this show, first of all, what the hell is wrong with you? But secondly, what we do here, it is really quite simple. We watch every single episode of Smoky Mountain Wrestling, beginning with episode number one on February 1st, 1992. And we go all the way to episode number 200 on November 26th, 1995. We talk about the good, the bad, the ugly, the indifferent, the so-so, the all-right, the amazing, the tremendous, the out-of-this-world, the unbelievable, the unforgettable, the unremarkable, the one-of-a-kind, the stuff you'll remember forever, the stuff you've already forgotten, and everything in between. We watch some matches, listen to some promos, and talk about some angles, and just have fun talking about old-school wrestling for about an hour. And then at the end of the show, I tell you what else has happened in the world of wrestling, because I can tell you May 8th, 1993, until I'm blue in the face, but this gives you some context. So you may say, oh, I remember that. Is that what was going on? And I say, yes, that was what was going on. And yeah, for sometimes I get the chance to go over an obscure New Japan show. Well, for the second straight week, um, our primary news story is going to come uh, outside of the United States. Exciting. Yes. So. We have one, I'm going to say one hell of an episode. To be honest, th this episode was not the greatest episode of Smoky Mountain Wrestling ever. Until, until, until the was. last 10 minutes. Yeah. Um, but uh, is, the those parts that are not great are newsworthy, though. Indeed. Now, this is technically the go-home show to Volunteer Slam 93. Uh, if you lived in Knoxville, and now, depending where you lived in the Smoky Mountain area, 
you either got the show on Saturday or Sunday, and we always base the date of the show as Saturday, even though you'll hear in promos one up on the show, they're saying tonight because in Knoxville, they got the show on Sunday. So it was tonight. Knoxville was volunteer slam. So yeah, in case there's any confusion. So with that out of the way, and that said, let's go to the intro of the show with Bob Cottle and Dutch Mantel, who are going to tell you about all the great stuff we're going to watch today. Another big welcome to all our Smoky Mountain wrestling fans, professional wrestling the way it used to be and the way you like it. I'm Bob Cottle along with Dutch Mantel, and fans, and we got another great one in store for you this week. You're going to see Dixie Dynamite, the dirty white boy, and the Night Stalker all in action right here. We got a bizarre interview, you won't want to miss this, from the master himself, the weird one, Kevin Sullivan. And I tell you, we're going to get a preview of the rage in the cage. Dutch, yes. if, if, you, if you can pay attention for just a moment. Yes, I am. I am paying attention. I always pay attention. We're going to have a great, great match. Stan Lane against Jimmy Golden. Jimmy Golden and Stan Lane meeting head to head today. We're going to get something settled today. The featured match here on Smoky Mountain Wrestling. And as always, the beat the champ. We got a new champion crown last week, of course. Wait, prime time, wait, wait, Brian. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Let me draw this week. You've been drawing every week. How about oh, that? Oh, Bob. Yeah, let me draw. Let me see if I, I'm gonna shut my eyes, Dutch. All right. Who'd I get? Well, read it. Killer Kyle. Killer Kyle will meet prime time Brian Lee today in the beat the champ tournament right here in Smoky Mountain Wrestling. Stay oh, it's gonna be a wild one, fans. We're ready. Let's go to the ring. Do you notice they always call it the beat the champ tournament? Trey. I'm sorry. I forgot to unmute myself. What are we reversing <laughs> yeah. positions now? Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I noticed that. By the way, the, the reference at the beginning of the show was uh, uh, Dutch's cue cards this week read Dutch for U.S. Senate, Bob for dog catcher. I, I, I don't know if Bob is uh, experienced enough to be the dog catcher. I wouldn't wish that on Bob. Bob's a good guy. Well, we're going to get Stan Lane versus Jimmy Golden and uh, Primetime Brian Lee versus Killer Kyle as our two uh, big matches this week, along with a whole bunch of people in action, along with a weird promo with Kevin Sullivan. And Bob Cottle was not lying. It was a weird fucking promo. Yes, it was. So if if your name gets drawn for the Beat the Champ TV match and you lose... I guess your name just goes right back into the pot and could, in theory, be drawn again next week. Because oh, Killer yeah. Kyle was just Killer Kyle just got the shot maybe like a month ago. Oh yeah, there there is no uh, rule that you only get uh, one shot. Or honestly, and I don't know if this ever actually comes up, but there, it's not even a rule that you only get one shot at the current champion. Just hey, if your name comes up, you're the uh, lucky one. Oh, that'd be, um, I hope they do something with that at some point. That'd be entertaining. Well, uh, we got our first match. It is the Avenger versus Dixie Dynamite. This is the first time we've seen the Avengers since he lost last week. Um, and you, you joined us, you know, about 10 or so episodes ago. So do you, Dixie Dynamite, just been this once a month or so character? But uh, Dixie has really suffered with the Smoky Mountain roster expanding because until about three or four months ago, he was a regular part of this show. He was wrestling, you know, more often than not. He'd get promo time. And honestly, once, uh, really actually once Tracy came in, you know, in many ways, Tracy took his spot, even though Dixie's spot was the opening of the show and Tracy's spot is the main event. But uh, Dixie went from being the number five babyface to, you know, being lucky to be on the shows. Man, rough time. Man. Just no. Nope. Mm -hmm. Uh, guess we got to have a a top confederate in the mix somewhere. And uh, Dixie is the uh, jobber confederate. Um, now I think the confederacy was the jobber confederates. Now, Avenger uh, did not follow the code of honor as the match began. Um, Dixie went for the handshake, and of course, Avenger 
being the heel guy in the mask, did not follow up on that one. Uh, but out came Tammy Fitch, of all people. She showed up at ringside to watch. She was carrying with her a picture of Hillary Clinton. So Bob Cottle made a comment about we know what side of the aisle she's on. And, of course, this is coming from Bob Cottle, who used to work for Senator Jesse Helms. So we know what side of the aisle he's on. And uh, Dixie won with the Confederate kick. Just can't imagine what interest Tammy Fitz would have in either of these guys. I, I know. I think, you know, the Avengers seems like the kind of guy that she'd be in the back blowing some other guy while the Avengers wrestle. Yeah. So... Um, so I wrote, I wrote that this was Candido's last appearance as the Avenger. So this is indirectly a mask versus mask match. But by the end of the show, this became a mask versus mask match where both the winner and the loser unmasked during the show. Spoiler alert, but yes. Um, uh, they only went like three minutes. Uh, I really want to see Chris Candido and Scott Armstrong for like 10 minutes. I don't think you're ever going to get that, but, you know, maybe we will, but I don't think so. Well, speaking of Dixie and speaking of Tammy, Tammy has dragged Dixie over to the interview area for a quick promo. <laughs> I'm going to try, Dutch. Fans right here with me now, and we mentioned earlier, Tammy Fitch, the young lady that has filed that sexual discrimination suit against Smoky Mountain Wrestling. And, uh, hey, you grabbed a guy by the hand and just led him right on over here. What have you got in mind? Well... <laughs> I just had a brilliant idea. In this article about my idol, Hillary Clinton, oh she says that she saw the greatness in Bill before anyone else did. It's because she's a genius, <laughs> kind of like me. So I figured I'd sign up a wrestler with not much obvious greatness, take him from the bottom, and see what I can do with him, build him up, and let's see. So Dixie. Um, just sign this contract. We'll get rid of all that silly Southern stuff, and I'll take you straight to the top. Well, ma'am, let me say this. The way I was raised, I was raised to treat a lady like a lady. But from what you've just said to me, if you were a man, I would handle this a little bit differently. But male or female, the answer is not only no, but hell no! Well, that's... Any way you want to look at it, that's a flat rejection. Well, I guess it takes a real man to be led by a woman. Oh, my heavens. All right. So, I mean, nothing special here, but yeah. Uh, Tammy insulted Dixie Dynamite, who basically said that if she were a man, he hit her, which, you know, great. And there's a that, lot of that. <laughs> there's a lot of that kind of thing going around here. Just casual, I, casual threats of violence. Yes. Um, but yeah, so Tammy's now been turned down by both Primetime Brian Lee and Dixie Dino Might, because, you know, it's that easy to turn down a hot ass 20 year old blonde in 1993. Well, you know, all those beautiful women in, in uh, East Tennessee and Eastern Kentucky. Well, you know, Tra you know, Tracy's here to kiss all the pretty ladies and uh, what have you. The but, ones that the Rock and Roll Express haven't already gone through. Yes, yes. Uh, speaking of Tammy, them. I, she's not quite comfortable speaking on camera yet, and you can tell. No, th this is literally her, you know, I mean, not her debut. She was on a couple weeks ago, but this is her, you know, beginnings in wrestling. She was not, you know, in wrestling at all until uh, Jim Cornette, you know, was at a Dennis Corluzzo show where, uh, you know, he was able to come up with an idea to let Candido come in because he met Tammy and was just like, yeah. hey, what the hell? And. Yeah, he, he wanted Candido, because why wouldn't you? But he couldn't pay him enough to justify having him move from New Jersey to Tennessee. But then he met her and thought that, well, if I get them both, I could both I could pay them both a little bit and they could live. And uh, yeah. that's how we get that's Tammy Sitch's uh, Entrada into the wrestling business. Now, 
we're on a show where we just listened to a promo by Dixie Dynamite, and we're going to skip a promo by the Rock and Roll Express just because there's a lot of stuff to listen here, and there's really nothing to this Rock and Roll Express promo. Did you have anything about it? Uh, not about the Rock and Roll Express promo. I do need to note, uh, there was something that I did not notice the last two weeks, but I noticed today... At the uh, the Holiday Inn at uh, 2615 Cumberland Falls Highway in Corbin, Kentucky, one of the features of this hotel is that you could bet on the horse races and watch them live right there from the hotel. Yes. I, I do recall they mentioned that last week. <laughs> I guess it just didn't register. Uh, I guess that's a thing in Kentucky. I mean, it is Kentucky, so I, mean, I kind of get it. Um. Bobby Blaze versus Dirty White Boy with Mr. Ron Wright. Uh, White Boy had a can of spray paint with him, continuing last week's angle uh, where he laid out Tracy Smothers and paint did a yellow streak on his back. Now, I got to say, you know, earlier today, Trey, you posted on Twitter saying you heard, like, one of the greatest promos of all time on this show. And so I'm waiting for it. And Mr. Ron Wright's on commentary, and he speaks for... 24 seconds and I'm going to play it right here and for a second I'm like is like is this what Trey was talking about like not really the greatest promo but like one of those haha point our fingers at the south kind of things uh let's go to Mr. Ron Wright we just we decided we got so many of these people you know after we've moved to the north got up where all of these good upstanding southern Yankee people are we've realized just how sorry and trashy and low down these southern people down here in the south really is. You know, it's no wonder they lost the war the way they did. If all of the southern people is like Tracy Smothers and back in the wartime, they all probably tucked their tail and run back south and hid somewhere. See, I, I, when when I heard that, I'm like, I wonder if that's what Trey was talking about, the uh, little promo there by, uh, uh, you know, Mr. Ron Wright. All I know is that I immediately wanted Ron Wright on commentary for every match because he was phenomenal. Uh, Mr. Ron Wright, like I, it's too bad he passed away because he should be on uh, national television today cutting promos. It oh god, one of the one of the the greatest tragedies of uh, the fact that uh, nobody used to keep their TV tapes is that we don't have fucking Ron Wright promos from the 60s and 70s because I bet that shit just like we have like one promo from like 72 or so Knoxville TV that god he's just phenomenal and I bet he was phenomenal just the whole time undoubtedly and it's one of those sad things unfortunately um by the way white boy in case you had any doubt white boy does win this match with Bucks North Blaster uh, after the match, White Boy goes to spray paint Bobby when Tracy runs down and runs him off. So that that was the the Buck Snort Blaster. Yes, the choke slam. Okay. okay, okay. This well, this was a very specific choke slam that I dubbed the Ore God Dirty White Boy. And why do you say that? Well, <laughs> so it, we we talked about my my Twitter name. It was a takeoff on. Uh, Origatawe, it was a Kuratawe's finishing move, one of them. And that's what it was. It's a backdrop into a choke slam. And I, I guess Tony Anthony, uh, yeah, I bet Tony Anthony was watching all Japan tapes in the early 90s. More than likely. He, or, uh, you know, or maybe he borrowed them from Cornette, you know. Yeah. Either, either way, he was Mark, watching. Mark Curtis, somebody had them. Yeah. yeah. Um, by the way, for whatever reason, I just remembered a uh, Mr. Wright's one and only appearance in the WWF. It was a Knoxville house show in 1997 that for some reason they were low on talent. So Corny got like Tracy booked and White Boy booked and, you know, he got Mr. Ron Wright booked. And uh, Cornette told the story in one of his uh, shows that I think it was Jack Land that called in the agent report. And talked about how this nice old man, Ron Wright, had put off his heart surgery so he could come uh, be on the show tonight. And, of course, that was, you know, Ron Wright's gimmick for years was, you know, he needed his heart surgery and yada, yada, yada. And, you know, Jack Lanza fell for it, which always made me laugh. Funny enough, 
So it uh, the Knoxville territory was uh, it, it, it's a territory going back at least probably to the uh, whenever whenever uh, Robert Fuller's grandfather would have started promoting in Tennessee, it probably started somewhere in there. And then in about uh, 74 or so, that was when Ron Fuller, Robert's brother, bought it. And then they had the big, the attempted coup d'etat led by Bob Roop in 79 that ended up uh, just killing the territory. And at that point, after a couple of years, uh, Lanza and Flair bought it. It is kind of a famous story that uh, they bought the territory and then couldn't really get it going because Flair couldn't be there because he was the NWA world champion. So then, I think years later, when uh, when uh, Cornette told Flair that he was going to start up a territory in in uh, Knoxville, Flair like jokingly said, "Hey, you got to pay me a percent of that. I bought that tor- territory with Lanza in '79." <laughs> so you, you you mentioning Lanza in relation to Knoxville wrestling made me think of that. Oh uh, lordy lordy, alrighty. So um, they re-air the angle from last week where. Uh, white boy spray paints Tracy, and then we go to Bob Cottle with Tracy for the second time on the show that I thought Trey was talking about the greatest promo of all time. All right, Tracy, there that, that's exactly what happened to you with that big yellow streak sprayed right down the back. You know, I see that tape right there, and that makes me sick. You know something, Tracy Smothers, the wild-eyed southern boy, has wrestled all over the world. But never, ever have I seen a man with laurel morals and values and a dirty white boy. Hey, white boy, I've been, I've been called a lot of things, I've done a lot of things, and I've said a lot of things. But by God, one thing they never called Tracy Smothers was a coward. Let me tell you something. You want to fight? You got to fight. Coward weighs a flag, big boy. I'm looking at you. I ain't going east. I ain't going west. I'm going north and south. And I'm going to kick your butt like your mama should have done a long time ago. Because I've been downwind of you. And I know why they call you the dirty white boy. I've got something you want. The Smoky Mountain heavyweight title. Something you cherish more than anything in the world. You come and try to get it, because I'm going to kick your butt like you should have been done a long time ago. All right, right now, let's go to the ring for more action, fans. So, I thought that was a tremendous promo by Tracy Smothers. Yes. Um, And, you know... Uh, mm -hmm. I also want to point out that he had on a sweet Brooks and Dunn shirt. Yes. Um... You know, especially these shows, like, this is the third taping uh, uh, of the night, you know, and so we've seen, Tra- these people have seen Tracy cut three promos now, and while, yeah, there's similarities between all three, all three of them are so completely different, building up this match, and I'm just, you know, really into this Tracy Smothers character, even with, you know, the love of the Confederacy, which again makes you a baby face in that part of the country. You believe he is who he purports to be, which is very important and to some degree a lost art. He he was these fans Hulk Hogan. You know, th- this was their guy. You know, we say that there we see this every week where they just lose their shit at the whole idea of Tracy Smothers. Yeah. And... Hulk Hogan and the Confederacy do have some things in common. <laughs> I- I'm afraid to ask you to elaborate. <sighs> oh. Let's well, go on. We got a winner leaves town match next. Yes. As, as the Night Stalker took on, weighing in at a combined weight of 220 pounds, Paul Lee. Don't get on me. That's what the announcer said. Ring announcer sucked ass. This wasn't the regular. What's the regular guy's name? The one that does uh, all the promos. Isn't it Brian? Brian Matthews, maybe. But yeah, but... something like that. This wasn't him. This was a. Uh, I don't know. Somebody that they found in in Barberville, I guess. Yeah. So of course, Night Suckers we've joked about for weeks. He comes out to Taz's theme song, and this week he earned the right to use Taz's theme song. As he wins quickly and decisively with a power bomb. 37 seconds. Yeah. And then Night Soccer cuts a promo. My only note is he says that he's six foot eight right after the announcers call him six foot ten. 
Well, you know, it, it you, you you grow and shrink according to how much uh, effort you exert during your match. But yeah, uh, this is Night Stalker's last TV match. Uh, yeah. His last match in the territory was May 1st. Uh, he's gone to be Adam Bomb. Yeah, uh, Scott Levy has shown up in the WWF, and so has Brian Clark. And uh, yeah, what what a weird combination. Raven and Wrath. Oh wow! I didn't even know that they were paired. Yes, and I, I knew. Yeah, I knew Scotty was paired with the Quebecers later. I didn't know he he started with Adam Bomb. Oh yeah, uh, and then somehow I think Harvey Whippleman gets him for five minutes, and that's about it. But uh, yeah. we. We're now going to go to what's referred to as a piece of bizarre information that came from Kevin Sullivan. And if this was, it wasn't for the fact that this was 1993 and not 1999, I would have just said this was a complete ripoff of the Blair Witch Project. I thought the same thing. <laughs> um, but uh, let's go to the woods with Kevin Sullivan. Commissioner Armstrong, you know, Kevin Sullivan was just trying to be a good guy, but that damn Commissioner Armstrong, he screwed him. And that's where we are. Uh, how is he getting weirder? <laughs> he, he's in a territory that is encouraging his weirdness. 
uh, whatever uh, this this therapist that he's got Smoky Mountain Wrestling paying for is not doing a very good job. He's shown I, no improvement. I mean, he he thinks he did, but now thanks to Commissioner Armstrong, you know, he's back to where he was before. Which, if that's the case, I feel bad for uh, all, uh, you know, all the baby faces here. I I feel bad for I don't know, he he's mad he's mad that Bob Armstrong doesn't want to pay for the therapist that isn't doing him any good. Well, you know, I, I don't wanna imply anything, but that therapy may have been a scam. You think? I think it's possible. Uh, next you're gonna tell me the woman that was feeding him fruits was his wife or something. <laughs> What shenanigans, you know, you know, if he did have a wife, I'm sure he'd have some kids. If it wasn't for that damn Commissioner Armstrong somehow stopping him from adopting children. He's sterile because of Commissioner Bob Armstrong. The funny thing is, I keep forgetting Night Soccer isn't in Rage in the Cage. And I mean... I guess it kind of makes sense, but at the same time, it's like, you know, we had that one match with Night Soccer and Kevin Sullivan on TV a couple weeks ago, and that was pretty much the blow off of the feud. As far as we saw on TV, yeah, because uh, I think that's, I mean, I don't know. He had, you know, a couple of house show matches after this. I don't know if they're going to show some clips of that. He did lose to Sullivan in a Singapore spike night on his last night. But as far as TV matches go, the this is the end of the Night Stalker. So I don't know. It must have been a uh, loser leaves town Singapore spike on a full match. Indeed. Yeah. Well, up next, I wrote that we were getting a Robert Fuller promo because when does Robert Fuller let anybody else talk during his promos? But no, in fact, this is a stud stable promo. Let's go now to the stud stable. Jimmy, I'm going to have to take my hat off to you, man, because you got you a good one today. I know you're looking forward to it. I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to make you proud of me. I'm going to make the stud stable proud of Jimmy Golden. I am Golden. proud of you. Stan I Lane, I've never you. seen you in the ring, boy, that you didn't have four or five guys around you, starting with Jim Cornette. This time it's going to be me and you, pretty boy. We're going to see how bright bad you are. And Jimmy Cornette, you've hit me with that racket your last time, boy. The last time I got in the ring with your man Bobby Eaton, you cost me that match. This time you will not cost me the match. And Stan Lane, I'm going to put you out, boy. I love it. You gotta love it. You know, tonight in Knoxville, let's remember one thing, too. And let's remember very clearly out there, rock and roll, don't figure you're gonna get yourself in a jam like you've been in the last few weeks, and we're gonna pull you out of it tonight. You're gonna have to do your own, Brian Lee. You're gonna have to do your own wrestling, man. We're not carrying you guys. We're going out there depending on you as partners to get a job done that well needs to be done. And then, Jimmy, we're gonna have the picking of the losers of the losers. I'm talking about the winner of the loser leave town match is going to have the stud stable and you'll get to be the losers of all time oh right it that that was another really good promo and i just, was like at this point i was thinking to myself okay we're getting a lot of really good promos in this show what promo is trey talking about when he says the greatest <laughs> promo of all time aired i was really looking forward to because i figured he meant the sullivan promo and so I'm like, okay, we'll, we'll see. Uh, you know, the Sullivan promo is all right. We didn't even really talk about it, but yeah. Uh, when but, you see it, you'll know. Yeah. Uh, but then we, so yeah, I, I don't know if this is the last promo they cut, but it might as well be because this is pretty much it for the stud stable we've discussed last week. And they're building Sad up a match. It. They're building up a match that will never happen. Sad about it. So Stan Lane with Jim Cornette and Dr. Tom Pritchard versus Jimmy Golden. Uh, Dutch decides to mosey on to ringside to make sure everything's on the up and up. And then we had a match. It's Stan Lane's last TV match. Spoiler alert. Uh, and to be honest, 
it wasn't anything to write home about. It was certainly, you know, six minutes of my life I'm never going to get back. Uh, to be fair, it was only four minutes and 48 seconds that you'll never get back. It was four minutes and 48 seconds of my life that I'll never get back. Um, Dr. Tom tried to get in the ring for the finish, but to quote Bob Cottle, Chuck Mantell stopped him. <laughs> not, not sure who the hell Chuck Mantell is, but apparently uh, he must be Dutch's younger brother or something. Uh, the referee got bumped. Go- Jimmy Golden, I had to rewind to see what this great move that Jimmy Golden laid out Stan Lane with was, because I'm like, okay, I, I somehow missed it. I saw the body slam, but I missed whatever the hell he did afterwards. Jimmy Golden laid out Stan Lane with a body slam and had him pinned for, you know, the count. Of course, no referee. So Corny rolls in, goes for an elbow drop, but Golden moves and Stan got it. And Bullet Bob runs in and counts the fall, giving the win to Jimmy Golden. So yeah, uh, Stan Lane's final televised wrestling match, he lost to a friendly fire elbow drop from his own manager. Yep, yep, yep. Poor, poor sweet Stan. Yeah. Poor Stanfield. He goes out on the back, on his back, counting the lights. Well. As he should. It's to his credit. We're now going to get a promo with um, someone who we've never seen in Smoky Mountains, at least since the first match on the show. Uh, Suicide Blonde Chris Candido. And uh, let's go to that uh, quick little promo right now. I'm the suicide blonde, Chris Candido, the WWA heavyweight champion. And out of the goodness of my heart, I wanted to come down to Smoky Mountain Wrestling and defend this championship, the world heavyweight championship. And I called, I wrote, I faxed that old fossil Bob Armstrong, and I hear now that he is refusing to recognize this beautiful championship belt as the world heavyweight championship. Well, let me tell you something. I plan on getting to the bottom of this situation. I'm going to come down there to Smoky Mountain Wrestling, whether you like it or not, and I'm bringing the most prestigious championship belt in the world with me, and I'm going to show you why I'm the best thing ever to come out of New Jersey. Forget about the boss. You're looking at the real boss. All right. So the WWA World Heavyweight Champion, does this make Dixie Dynamite the linear WWA World Heavyweight Champion? So here's the thing, because I looked into this. Uh, Chris Candido was not the WWE heavyweight. I'm sorry. He was. He definitely wasn't the WWE heavyweight champion. He, he was not the WWA heavyweight champion. Uh, the WWA heavyweight champion at this time, would you like to guess? Just take a wild guess. Gino Caruso. The Spider. The, the, wrestler, the, be, the wrestler best known as Headbanger Thrasher was the WWA heavyweight champion. Nice. Yeah. So not poor Gino Caruso. Darn it. Uh, but uh, so yeah, he's going to bring that title down and he's going to defend it on Smoky Mountain, whether Bob Armstrong likes it or not. And we've learned that the easiest way to get anything to happen on this show is to just slide a paper across the secretary's desk. And if you do that, you'll get on the show. No problem. Fucking Pam. This is Pam's fault, isn't it? Undoubtedly. You know, she probably was like, what's a WWA? I heard the WWF. <laughs> For the record, I've never heard Pam Lawson speak, so I got no idea what she even sounds like. I, I, I assume it's exactly like that. Yes. Uh, poor Pam Lawson. Uh, she, sound, she sounds like a New Englander. Uh, mimicking an East Tennessee accent. I'm just sure of it. Oh, yes. Um, a New Englander who was born in New York and raised in Pennsylvania. Um, <laughs> by the way, we talked about the linear WWA title. And um, do you, I, I don't know if we actually talked about this, but do you ever subscribe? Do you subscribe to the Observer site? Yeah. Did you listen to uh, Brian and Dave's SummerSlam review on Saturday? I haven't. Okay, so I listened to a little bit of it, and uh, Dave talked about what you have actually noted on this show before, that Drew McIntyre, by beating CM Punk, is now the linear AEW world champion. And 
they, God bless them. I say this as an atheist. God bless it. Um, he starts talking about how, man, it, it would have been a big deal when they were kids if, you know, wow, somebody became the linear AEW ch world champion. What a big fucking deal. And I'm sitting here like, I was a huge fucking mark as a kid. Like, absurdly so. There's no way in hell I would have kept track of who the hell the linear WWF champion was in 1994. And here's the thing. That actually happened when Flair went to the WWF as the WCW champion. He, he was the linear WCW champion and the linear NWA champion. And, like, I didn't give two fucks. I didn't sit here and go, oh, my God, you know, Roddy Piper beat Ric Flair in Cincinnati. That makes him the linear NWA champion now. Like, I, I think Dave, um, I, I used to joke that Dave or I are the biggest marks in wrestling history. I think Dave's officially beaten me. Dave, we love him. Yes, we do. He's a good guy for the most part. He um, is. But, yeah. So, again, earlier today you tweeted out a few things that made me think that you watched the wrong episode. Because you <laughs> talked about, you know, that there was a, a mask versus mask match where both guys lost their mask. And then, like, until the Candido promo happened, I'm like, he must be smoking the good shit this week or just watching the wrong show because neither of them took their mask off. And they're the only two masked wrestlers on the show. And then, uh, you know, the Candido promo happens, and I'm like, okay, but this, I figured, okay, he's just talking about a winner leaves town match, and they didn't really hit me yet that Night Stalker was gone. So I'm like, okay, maybe this is Dixie Dynamite's last match with Dixie Dynamite, which, I mean, technically it was, but that wasn't the one you were talking about. So I'm like, eh, maybe that's what he's talking about. What the hell is he talking about the mask now? What is he talking about the greatest promo of all time? We had some very good promos this week, but I wouldn't label any of them as the greatest of all time. I didn't say the greatest of all time. I said one of the greatest promos in Smoky Mountain history. Okay. All right. Uh, even that, okay, I'm like, okay, none of these promos are really one of the greatest promos in Smoky Mountain history. And then Jim Cornette went to the announce desk. Yes. And, it's, and to set the stage, Corny is pissed. He, he looks like he's about to have an apoplexy. He 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 need he might be having a six hour heart attack right now. Um, he doesn't have a tie on. He doesn't. I don't know even remember who wears his glasses ever on the show, but he's not wearing glasses now. He is disheveled. He is angry, and Bob Cottle is mad because this is in his interview time. And let's just go to Bob and Jim and. Uh, let the magic happen. Uh, no, uh, Jim, this is not your interview time. You, uh, I don't care. Uh, hey, you no, are, you, you ain't telling me what's going to go around. I'll punch you in the face, too, Bob. Call it a heart. You've already had your interview time. This Let is me, not for you. I don't care. Let me just say something, Bob Armstrong. You see, I'm very near having a stroke. You see, I've got a lot of problems going on in my life right now. And I know all these people would love to see me drop over and pop arteries out of my neck. And I know that you would love to be the cause of it. But let me tell you something, Bob Armstrong. You've gone way too dead gum far right now. Ever since day one, you have been against Jim Cornette. You've been against the heavenly bodies. You've been against everything I've tried to do, and you have done your dead level best to run me out of Smoky Mountain Wrestling. And that's okay because I've done the same to try to get you unseated as commissioner. And I don't care whether every single one of these stinking coupon clipping food stamp eating rednecks thinks that you're the greatest thing since sliced bread or not. I've got a different story to tell. Bob Armstrong, you're nothing but a stinking, crooked politician. That's all you've ever been, a stinking, crooked wrestler at one time. And then, since you're so old, since you're so stinking old that you're retired now, you're a stinking, crooked politician. And I personally am ashamed that Smoky Mountain Wrestling has a stinking old redneck like you running it. But let me tell you this, you know, I sit here and I get all upset and I'm about ready to pass out. But you know, I ought to be laughing. I ought to be happy. 
because you see, everybody knows that I'm successful. Everybody knows the heavenly bodies are the greatest thing in the world. And everybody knows that regardless of the rage of the cage or the last angle in Tennessee, we're going to remain that way. But you know something, Bob Armstrong? Everybody's ashamed of you. Not only these fans, not only everybody at Smoky Mountain Wrestling, your whole stinking family's ashamed of you. You want to know, hey, Dixie Dynamite, that goof running around here with a sock on his face, you know who that is? That's Scott Armstrong. I'll say it right now. That's his stinking son. That's Bob Armstrong's son, Scott Armstrong, who is so ashamed of his old man that he has to wear a mask over his face. He's ashamed to be a member of the Armstrong family. He's ashamed to be associated with a crook like Bob Armstrong, so he wears a mask over his face like a common stinking criminal. That's what Dixie Dynamite is. He's got to hate it. Hey, 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 here, yeah. here is Dynamite. Let me tell you something, brother. I ain't ashamed of nothing. I am Scott Armstrong. I don't owe you nothing. I don't owe nobody nothing. Let me tell you something. And I want everybody else to know it too. I'm not ashamed of my father. I love my father with all of my heart. He is the most honest man I have ever met. And I'll tell you something else too. He raised me and my brothers to be good, good hearted men. Whether I wear a sock on my head, the reason I wore a sock on my head is so that whining mama's boys like you didn't run their mouth to the promotion, Sandy Scott, saying that he's daddy's boy. So let's show him a little favoritism. Brother, I didn't want the favoritism, so I wore the mask because I love my father. Well, there's your answer. Yeah, that's a great sentiment, Scott Armstrong, but let me tell you one thing, I don't love your father. Hey, because he's been against me and mine ever since day one. You come out here and you say, I love my daddy. That's why I'm going to wear a sock on my face. Well, I got news for you. I think you're still ashamed. And I'm, hey, hey, hey. And here, here's Look, our Commissioner Armstrong. Listen, if you've got something to say to somebody, don't be talking about my family. Don't be talking to these fans. Have a little guts. Say it to my face. If you've got something to say, say it. For God's sake, just say it to me. That's exactly what I'll do with it. I'll say it to your Ernest T. Bass looking face with that cap on. I'll say it to you. You are without a doubt the lowest form of human life that I've ever known in my life. You say you're the commissioner and you push a pencil and you tell people where to go and you tell people what to do and you make all these rules and you've been trying to screw me since day one. But it ain't worked and it ain't gonna work. And no matter what you do, it is not gonna work. You know what you're like? You know what you're like, huh? You know what you're like, big man, big barrel chest? You're like a drill sergeant hiding behind his stripes. You're like a police officer hiding behind his badge. You've got that commissioner's tie on. And as long as you wear that commissioner's tie, Mr. Commissioner, can't nothing happen to you. Can't nobody punch you in the face. That's what you're hiding behind is that commissioner's tie. Hey. If this tie is bothering you, let me solve your problem. It's just a clip-on tie. It comes right off, the shirt comes open, the tie goes down, and it's very simple. It's very simple. The tie's off now. If you got something else to say, let's hear it. I'm saying to you, Armstrong, you've gone too stinking far. You have tried to best me for the last time. You're not only the only one involved in this, but your family is who Brad down there in Atlanta, Steve sitting home wherever he is, Peanut Head over there, and it's Brian, the little one, the one that went off and joined the Marine Corps and became known as the world's biggest deserter for hot off. Oh, wait a minute. And Armstrong has got him. If you ever say anything about my family again, brother, I'm going to knock you out. You can't talk to me like that. Oh, and he does, and down goes Cornette. As the commissioner slugged him, and Cornette hits the floor, and he hits it hard, fans. While we get things back together here, let's take a moment to find out more about the Volunteer Slam. Where do we even start with this? Fucking phenomenal. Oh, we got all-time great line. It's just a clip on die. It comes right off. Can I just note, like, you know, we've seen Bob Armstrong now for, you know, 67 weeks. And he's always wearing, you know, his big-ass shirt and tie. I I did not realize just how fucking huge he still was. Because when he takes oh, off yeah. his tie and he unbuttons his shirt, like, God damn, his chest is just popping out of his shirt. And I'm like, fuck, this guy, you know... 
th- th- this guy kick a lot of people's asses right now. Absolutely. This was one of those promos. It started really good with Cornette just ripping on Bullet Bob, and it's like, okay, we, we the big angles coming up. Everybody pretty much has figured out that the big angle with Cornette and Bob is coming up very soon, and so we're we're pouring gasoline on the fire here, and it's like, okay, then then it picks up, then. He brings up Bob's kid. He brings up Dixie Dino Mike, saying that Dixie, Dixie's Scott Armstrong, and he's so ashamed of being Bob's son that he comes out here wearing a mask and hides who he is. So out comes Dixie Dino Mike, and he's like, you know what, motherfucker? You're right. I am Scott Armstrong, and, you know, I'm proud of my daddy. I love him. He's the most honest man I know. And, you know, I wore a mask so you couldn't claim favoritism, motherfucker. And then out comes Bullet Bob. And he's like, it's just escalating each step of the fucking way here. We're just, you know, dousing this, not just in gasoline. Like, all flammable liquids are now being poured onto this, you know, fire right here. As Gasoline, Bob- kerosene, butane, what, are, what else is flammable? Uh, whale oil whale oil is being poured on here bullet bob comes out he dares corny to say this to his face cornette says he's the lowest form of trash he's ever seen bob hides behind his commissioner's tie he hides behind his hat so bob turns his hat around he pulls off his clip-on tie he unbuttons his shirt and you know he dares cornette to keep going and so Cornette, he crosses the line because up to now, it's like, okay, you're like, you're walking that line, Corny, but it's like, watch yourself. And then he crosses the fucking line. He brings up all of his kids. He talks about Brad being down in Atlanta. He talks about Steve doing God knows what. Scott being here. And then he brings up Brian and he calls him the world's biggest deserter. And Bob gripped him the fuck up and Cornette shit his pants at this point. Because Bob, like a pissed off Bob Armstrong, you want no part of him. I don't care how fake wrestling is. Bob Armstrong, especially in this moment, it was as real as it gets. I wouldn't have messed with Bob Armstrong when he was 75. When Bob was on his deathbed a few years ago, I, I would not have messed with him then either. And no, and of course, you know, Bob lets him go and turns around and walk away. So Corny keeps going and Bob turns around and knocks him the fuck out. Yes. And okay. it's like, yeah, we'll get to this next year. Actually, not even, well, yeah, next year, but in six months. They essentially do this angle in Mid South with uh, Bill Watts, and it's great. I would say this is even greater. I don't know. I haven't seen the Watts one yet, so I'll, I'll, I'll reserve judgment. But this was a seven and a quarter star segment. Oh, and everybody, fuck. everybody involved. Cornette was great. Scott was great. Bob was great. Bob Cotta was great. Just everybody involved in this. This was a phenomenal piece of wrestling television. Like we've we've mocked Bob Cottle at times, and, and you know this was one of those times where it's like he did his job perfectly. You know, I don't. I I would imagine Bob Cottle didn't really know what was about to happen, but you know he knew something special was happening, and he knew to stand in the back and keep my fucking mouth shut because I'm not adding shit to this. And the show could should have just ended right here. Yeah. I don't know why. I don't know why this wasn't the last segment. Because we had to have primetime Brian Lee defending the Beat the Champ TV title against Killer Kyle. And... No, we really didn't. 
And I mean, I guess it was so they could have, uh, you know, the baby face, the, the, the giant fight at the end. But like, A, it wasn't even the first time in this taping that we had the giant fight with both teams. And the crowd, which was crazy for it last week, didn't care so much this week, partially because we've already seen it, and partially because we just fucking saw that great angle with Cornette. After you a know? segment like that, there is nowhere to go emotionally but down. Yeah. Cornette's going to hate hearing this, but this was very Vince Russo. You know, it was, let's do the greatest angle of all time in this segment, and then immediately come back with another giant brawl two minutes later. Well, do you know going into it that it's going to be an all-time great segment? I mean, I know in retrospect, like you can tell by the way he talks about it, this is one of the segments that he's most proud of. But like, I mean, I, you, you you probably don't know when you're when you're formatting the show that I mean, this is okay. going to be an all timer. You don't know, but it's like, you know, Corny came up with this angle, like knowing that it was going to be, if maybe not the greatest angle of all time, but it was going to be a very heavy, you know, heated angle. Because like you had all that happening all at the same time. You had Dixie Dynamite revealing himself you know, as one of the Armstrongs. You had Bob finally getting fed up with this motherfucker who hasn't stopped running his mouth in a year and a half and laying him the fuck out. It's like everything just came in right now. And it's like, even if like even if it wouldn't have been as great in execution as I'm sure it was in Corny's head, it's like, how could he have thought that, you know, primetime Brian Lee versus Killer Kyle with everything that happened afterwards, live up to that. Like, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think Killer Kyle is going to live up to very much. Like, literally, like I get, you know, they were on a very limited budget, no doubt. But I would have found a way if I were them to like re-edit the show, put this TV title match on, you know, at the beginning of the show or the second match in the show, you know. And, I mean, you probably still could have saved the show-ending promo for the end of the show. But, still, this should have been, this should not have followed that last segment, you know? Yeah, and and the way it was laid out, like, I I kind of understand that with the way they laid it out, it would, it, it would kind of fuck it up if you, if you uh, change the order of the segments, but... Yeah, I don't know. Hindsight is twenty twenty, And then it's like, at the end of the day, you know, and Killer Kyle is Cornette's guy. Cornette and the Heavenly Body just run in for the disqualification in like three minutes. And uh, a minute ten. It's not even three minutes. So Primetime Brandley wins by DQ, so he gets his thousand dollars. By the way, doesn't even get mentioned on the show. They just ignore that whole part. But um, the show end. Well, the show doesn't end with it, but you know we get the uh, heel beat down. You know the baby face is running for the save, and eventually order is restored. Um, and the show actually ends. And I'm not even going to play to this point because again, it's so anticlimactic. The show ends with a baby face promo with the rock and roll prime time and bullet Bob. Bob basically said he's going to leave early so he can get to the arena. Um, Ricky Morton was wondering where the stud stable was, and Brian Lee said he'll get his hands on Kevin Sullivan. I should note that Rock and Roll Express cut two promos on this show. Ricky Morton talked three times, and Robert Gibson didn't talk at all, and that was for the best. Yeah, that's what it should be most of the time, probably. Yes. Um, next week, we're going to see clips of the Volunteer Slam. I don't know if we're going to have an actual show in addition to that, like, you know, if there's any uh, live stuff, but we'll see, I guess. Um, but yeah, um, this is a show where I don't know if it's worth going anywhere to see, but that six minutes there towards the end, that is uh, well worth going on your way to see. You know, if you've Absolutely. seen, yeah, if you've seen the Mid South Angle, in my opinion, this one is better, even though it's kind of, in many ways, it's the exact same thing. 
because the Mid South angle has Eric as uh, Cornette talk about Bill Watts's kids, and that's what leads Watts to threatening him. And then he got the crazy ass punch, and you know, ten ish years later, Cornette tried to recreate it here. You know, older with you know a bum knee. And uh, he did his damnedest, and I think, you know, did a fantastic job of it. Yeah, just, but, and this is, this is what we've been building to since the beginning of this company. We're getting there. Yeah. Pretty much since the moment Bullet Bob showed up and told us the rules of Smoky Mountain, it's been leading to this moment. Mm hmm. But uh, that's going to for Smoky Mountain, even with. 44 minutes of easily skippable stuff, I'd still give it an easy thumbs up. Yeah, this is uh, this is one of those shows that there's one thing on it that's so important that you gotta you gotta see it. Yeah. And then speaking of things that are almost anticlimactic at this point, because you know, how are we gonna follow this? We're gonna end the show by telling you what else is happening this week in wrestling, because as always, we can tell you May 8th, 1993, it's kind of blue in the face, but this gives you some context so you know, hey, this also happened. I remember that. And the big thing coming from across the pond, the other side, Terry Funk wrestled at Sushi Onita in an exploding ring barbed wire death match. And Yes, for those who know, like Trey, this is where AEW got the idea during the John Moxley Kenny Omega match. Um, Onita won. He leaves to go to the back, and Funk remained unconscious in the ring, and they started doing the countdown. And Onita, who at the end of the day, he just went to war with this guy, but this is still his fucking idol. He doesn't want him to blow up in a ring. Onita runs back into the ring, covers Terry Funk to protect him as the ring explodes. And while the reports were that the explosion was not as impressive as the test explosion that they did a few weeks earlier, it was still miles and miles ahead of the famous uh, AEW uh, a few years ago. That, uh, the AEW one, I'm sorry, it was the wrestling equivalent of a ruined orgasm. That I, I just re watched that, uh, the other day too. It was like, it, uh, it's like, it's what, so mm -hmm. what sucks is they had a fucking great match and nobody remembers it. All anybody remembers is the fucking pyro. That whole show was a really, really great show. and But no one remembers that, of course. You just remember the climax, and they blew it. And it's funny, because in many ways, like, I'll, t I'll say, and I know that obviously they get higher, because you know, after this, Punk still comes in. They still draw a much higher buy rate. But in many ways, this is kind of the beginning of the end, in some ways, of AEW. Because, hey, we're having this ultimate stipulation that we fucked up. And I know a lot of people who bought that show specifically for the explosion. And they were incredibly disappointed, obviously. Yeah, that sucks. But, uh, excuse me. Sorry. So, yeah, the uh, the original is much better. Uh, so, if you don't know, when... when uh, when Giant Baba started All Japan in 1972, like he he already knew the Funks was close to the Funks, and it, like he would book all this American talent through the Funks, but then also he would send uh, he would send people there to be trained before I guess before they had the the dojo set up, or maybe it was just for like special cases like uh, Jumbo Saruta they sent to train with the Funks, Genichiro Tenru, and. At Sushi Onita, believe it or not, when he like for the first out of eight ten years of his career, at Sushi Onita was a high flying junior heavyweight, and then in about eighty four, uh, he destroyed his knee and wasn't going to be able to to wrestle anymore. But then a few years later, he got the notion that he could do 
a completely different style of wrestling. And he's really like, I don't know. People have a certain vision of Onita, maybe the idea that he's a garbage wrestler. And he did, you know, he did a lot of death matches and stuff. But when it comes to like conveying emotion to the audience, Onita's got to be one of the greatest of all time. I got to say, it really is hard to imagine that Sushi Onita as a high flying junior heavyweight. No, you like uh, he's got like he feuded with uh, Chavo Guerrero. They had great matches. It, it, you wouldn't, it just you wouldn't expect it if you didn't know it. I can't imagine it. Um, by the way, ESPN. Uh, this is the end of them flirting with uh, pro wrestling, but they have begun airing random tapes of pro wrestling. Uh, including Global and the USWA. And uh, reports are negative. Uh, the picture quality was subpar. There's no crowd audio. And the only enjoyment you're going to get out of it at the moment is botched graphics galore, including ne- including one announcing that the next match was going to be Calvin Knapp versus Jobber. <laughs> it's phenomenal. Yes. Thank you, ESPN, for introducing us to Inside Wrestling Terms in 1993. The fuck and- kind of name is Calvin Knapp? Exactly. Um, <laughs> and then, in one of those, like, like I mean, I kind of knew this story because uh, Booker T had told it uh, on his a biography, but hiding down in page 12 of The Observer this week, it's told that Sid, yes, that Sid, was the person that not only got WCW to hire Robert Fuller, a.k.a. Colonel Robert Parker, so blame him for our lack of Robert Fuller moving forward, but also wants WCW to bring in this team from Dallas called the Ebony Experience. Who, of course, are Booker T and Stevie Ray, Harlem Heat. Mm-hmm. And it's like, it, it's funny because like you don't think of Sid as somebody who's out there spotting great talent. I think a Sid is capable of a great many things that we don't credit him with. He, he, Sid, it's like, and I, you know, growing up in the Northeast, I can attest to this. Sid, I remember I watched a Sid shoot interview once where he basically talked about how, for whatever reason, he's super over in the Northeast. And I yeah. can tell you that, yes. As somebody who lives in the Northeast, it did not bother me that Sid had almost no wrestling ability. You know, Sid yeah. was the fucking man. Go watch Survivor Series 96 if you've never seen it. Yep. That is Sid at his most Sid. Yes. You have never seen somebody doing a more I'm winning the fucking belt entrance before. And Sean doing a I'm losing the belt entrance. <laughs> um, yeah. I was watching uh, Guilty as Charged 99 not that long ago where Sid debuts in ECW. as And the crowd, of course, goes crazy, which defeats that whole, oh, we're the ECW audience, you know, blah, 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 blah. But fucking, and I get this is more John Cronus, because, I mean, you know, what's Sid really doing in this move? But Sid's wrestling Cronus. Sid picks him up for a choke slam. And choke slams him over the top rope through a table at the ringside in one amazingly fluid motion. And John Cronus is a big motherfucker. Like, you know, yeah. but that was just a crazy ass spot. Yeah, I watched that show maybe uh, two or three years ago. And it's, <laughs> it's somebody because, like, that's the thing that people point to is that, like, ECW fans have this whole reputation, you know, and they hate the the stereotypical wrestlers like Sid, you know, the big quote unquote talentless lugs. They lost their fucking minds when Sid came out. Yeah. And it like they will have lost their minds for any, you know, top, you know, WWF guy or WCW guy. Can like, you imagine well, Do you imagine if Ric Flair actually showed up at the ECW arena? They would have been sucking his dick. Yeah. 
I don't know. Ric Flair's probably never had 1,100 blowjobs in one night before. He would have gotten them that. Speaking of sucking dick at the ECW arena. Speaking of sucking dick at the ECW arena. (laughs) Oh, the the vice presidential candidate, J.D. Vance, is doing a rally at the 2300 arena today. Did you see that? Oh, my God. Is that where his fucking rally was at? Yes. And I wasn't... (laughs) I pointed out, and then a couple of people made the same joke. Uh, probably the biggest scumbag to run that building since Rob Back Black. <laughs> are, are, are you sure it's since Rob Black? I mean, you know, he I, he may he may have Rob Black be here. You know, I bet, I bet it, there's some kind of crossover there between JD Vance fans and Rob Black fans. It's probably unfair to say that about uh, Rob, about uh, JD Vance. <laughs> who um, are who are we degrading here? Yes. Oh Lord. Uh, but uh, yeah. So, if anything else you want to talk about? Hey, you want to talk about SummerSlam? What do you think of SummerSlam? You know, I. With the uh, the feedback that I was following on my Twitter feed, and it it my Twitter feed tends to be a lot more in the spectrum of people who favor other types of wrestling over WWE. Mm-hmm. Uh, I thought that a lot of them were very unfair to SummerSlam as a wrestling show. I thought, okay, i I didn't like the I didn't really like the Nia match. I did not like the main event. Other than that, I thought this was a pretty good show. I agree with you about that. Uh, I, I mean, I can tell you from sitting there in the crowd, we were all like, it doesn't matter what happens here because nothing happens until, you know, the bloodline runs in. And we yeah. were we were all commenting, you know, what, like, you know, what would happen if Roman doesn't show up? Because, yeah, we we all wanted Roman there, but we were all kind of like, but what if? Like, what if he just doesn't appear? Because, you know, that's it's not a guarantee. It could just be Cody overcomes the odds, you know. And to be honest, I was more, and it made, it made more sense for the storyline for it to be Orton and Kevin Owens, but I was more disappointed it wasn't the Usos running out at first, but it still makes sense because this is the Roman redemption storyline. He just spent, you know, three years pissing on everybody or four years pissing on everybody. And now he has to redeem himself, not just to the fans, not but to his family. So it's like, I don't, you know, it wouldn't make sense for the Usos to embrace him on day one. You know, they they got a, a good, good year plus out of this Roman redemption storyline and hopefully it doesn't get rushed. Um, like them thinking, Oh God, we got to get this, you know, we got to get it all set by WrestleMania next year. Like, it doesn't have to be all set till WrestleMania the following year. You have plenty of time, you know, to make this shit work. So <laughs> what we need is for, uh, we need Roman to go through solo Sokoa and get it over with. So we can get to the real money match, Roman Reigns versus Jacob Fatu. See, I, I agree, but I have this sneaking suspicion that Solo's the final boss. Yeah, I would. I, I feel like that's probably the WrestleMania match. Now, my brother and I basically, you know, I'm sure we're not the only people to, you know, say this. But War Games is going to be Bloodline versus Bloodline. But who do you have as Roman and the Usos partner? And my thought is Sami Zayn. And that's when Sami turns heel on Roman. Yeah, I think a lot of people anticipate that that'll be Sami Zayn. So, let's see. Uh, Yeah, solo time. So, here's the thing. You do a four on four or you do a four on five? Because if it's if it's a four on four, I I wonder if it might be uh, Solo and Jacob Fatu and uh, FKA the Gorillas of Destiny against uh, 
Roman, the Usos, and uh, Hikaleo. I wonder if Hikaleo might uh, come in to side with uh, Reigns. Or you could have Hikaleo on the heel bloodline side and have uh, Sammy and Kevin be on the babyface side. And you could either have just Sammy or both of them turn on. Because why the hell would Sammy and Kevin team with them? Honestly, uh, 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 Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn turning on uh, the Usos and Roman Reigns would make a hell of a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, and by the way, I will say I've been to a lot of shows. Now, I admit I wasn't at Elimination Chamber in Montreal. I wasn't at Money in the Bank in Chicago. However, I will tell you that when Roman Reigns hit solo, that was the biggest fucking pop I've ever heard at a show that I've been at in my life. Really? Yes. That was fucking insane. I don't know how it came across on TV because I haven't watched the show back, but the crowd lost their ever-loving minds. So louder than the uh, the uh, Austin and Rock entrances at WrestleMania 30, because that's probably the loudest reaction I ever heard was Austin's entrance on that show. I I would say yes, and I remember uh, marking my ass out for that. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, I think that's the only time I've ever seen Steve Austin live. Um, I saw him at 32 as well when they did the running on the League of Nations. And it was him. Oh Foley yeah, I was and... I was at that I was at that show too, and I forgot about it. I mean, it's easy to forget. <laughs> oh, and I was also at WrestleMania 27 when he was the referee for Jerry Lawler and Michael Cole. Which at least I did. Uh, probably the only time I will ever see The Rock wrestle live when he had his six second match against Eric Rowan. I have seen The Rock wrestle live. Let me see how many times, including the Rowan match, I guess. Uh, four times? Unless he did some other random match that I'm forgetting. So I was at the two Cena matches. Uh, I was at the Rowan quote unquote match. And then I was at the tag match this year. Oh my God, that tag match. That was so fucking long. And... It, it, it may still be going on at this point. Yeah. The problem, and it was the same problem with the Cody and Roman WrestleMania match, which was a better match uh, because uh, Solo Sokoa is not very good. Sorry. Uh, but the problem with those matches, when you when the match is built around interference and then they just fucking wrestle for 15 minutes yeah. and you're just waiting for... Because you know, you know nothing's going to happen until the interference happens. I actually yeah. respect w- when that's the thing and when they just immediately start doing the fucking interference. Like, yep. just be honest about it. Because it's like I was thinking about this too. And, you know, I'm sure we were all kind of thinking to some extent. Why did nobody come out with Solo? Why wasn't it four on one from the opening bell? So they could hit the ring at uh, the 16 minute mark. Pretty much. And we thought Jacob Fatu tore his Achilles tendon. And I out... thought he broke his ankle. Yeah. And but I guess uh, apparently he was made... fine. Yeah. And that that was just a uh, a pretext to not have Jacob Fatu face off with Roman Reigns at this point. Yeah. The... I... I'm kind. Of, I'm really looking forward to the eventual Jacob Fatu Roman Reigns match, but it's like, I don't know. There's part of me that's like, is that really the best match they could have? It doesn't always necessarily matter if it's the best match they could have, but you know, I don't know. I, I think uh, Paul Heyman has some work on his hands to try to put uh, that one through. Let's put that so, one together. Uh... Let, let me think here. Okay, yeah. So I actually thought this happened at, at Backlash, and I was wrong, but I think it finally technically happened at uh, Money in the Bank when they had that six-man. 
Uh, Tama Tonga and Jacob Fatu became the first people in WWE history to team on a WWE pay-per-view whose fathers also teamed on a WWE pay-per-view. Really? Yeah. Because uh, 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 Tama Tonga's father, obviously, is uh, is Haku. And uh, uh, Jacob Fatu's father is Samu, the Tonga kid. Tama, yeah. Or, Tom, yeah, I, I, I mix up the names. Uh, yeah, the, the, they, yeah. The, they were the Islanders. Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah, I thought the first time. Oh, okay, so when they did the uh, when they did the the match at Backlash with uh, Solo Sokoa and Tama Tonga, I thought that was it. But then I remembered that uh, the match that I was thinking about with Rikishi and Haku, they didn't actually team on the pay-per-view. They just ran in. The uh, No Way Out show. Yeah. Yes. Uh, let it be known that I can remember who did a run-in on a random WWF pay-per-view in 2001, but I can barely remember what happened at Forbidden Door, a show that I was at five weeks ago. Yeah, what was it? <laughs> because No Way Out was one of, I don't know, 20 wrestling tapes that I had when I was a teenager, so I've probably seen that show dozens of times. Oh, we we had hundreds of tapes. I'm not even, like, lying when I say hundreds. You know, it, we, we had an insane tape collection, and sadly, I was not smart enough to convert them to DVD or, you know, keep a VCR. That would have been too easy. Yeah, kind of wish I'd uh, hung on to a VCR. By the way, I should have said this at the beginning of the show, not the end of the show. So the um, if you're following us on YouTube, you might think that I'm just being an asshole or just being a bad po- uh, podcaster and not uh, uploading episodes. Well, the problem is, the website that we upload everything through, the RSS website, um, it only will upload videos or podcasts of less than two hours to YouTube, which is why I've instituted our unofficial two-hour rule. Um, otherwise, I have to physically go in and you know make a YouTube video with the podcast and then upload it afterwards, which, you know, let's be honest, that I'm a little lazy to do sometimes which is why you might be wondering where the hell the tuesday show is if all you did was uh you know listen to us on youtube so please if you would like to guarantee that you will hear every single episode of this very fun podcast check us out on every streaming platform imaginable do you have spotify everybody has spotify we're on spotify we're on apple Podcasts. we're on google Podcasts. we're on fucking everything go check it out go subscribe it is the one absolute guarantee that you'll get this show uh pandora iheart radio deezer whatever the hell that is we're on there go subscribe it is your one absolute guarantee that no matter how long we go no matter how lazy i get that you will hear every single episode unedited, uninterrupted, unlike my uh, video of LA Knight's entrance at SummerSlam that WWE pulled for copyright reasons, but let every other video I took up, you know, that that I'm pissed Weird. about. Yeah. But anyway. Why? Yeah. Like CM Punk, I've got that, his entrance up. With Cult of Personality blasting, no issue. Gunther winning the world title. Nia Jax winning the women's title. These are all videos from my seat that I took during the show that YouTube airs without a problem. But LA Knight's entrance? No, we can't have that from 50 yards away. Did you get a video of Drew McIntyre winning the linear AEW World Championship? I did not. I'm sorry. Pity. I know. I don't know. But unless there's anything else you want to talk about, we're going to start wrapping things up this week. We went actually less than 90 minutes this week. Uh, 
just want to mention in the in, in, uh, process of our SummerSlam review, Gunther's awesome and all is right with the world now that the ring general is the world champion and we have a we have a champion who we can take pride in who holds the mat sacred. You say general weird. No, I, I said it in German. The ring general. Do, do you remember and, there was a skit on Raw last year where uh, Ludwig Kaiser and Giovanni Vici are just walking down the hallways uh, warning people that Gunther was arriving next week and they run into Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn and they're like, dude, we're, we're just trying to talk. Like, give us five minutes, come back, we'll talk some more. They're like, well, don't you understand? We are Imperium. And Sami Zayn's like, you'll still be Imperium in five minutes. Come back and we'll talk. <laughs> and, <sighs> It was a tr- it's a tremendous segment. Um, but yeah. Great. So, all right. Before we wrap things up, do you want to say anything else to the people? Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, go into the search bar and type wrestleism, just the word wrestle, and then ISM is one word. And uh, if you like dumb videos of like Fire Pro Wrestling gameplay, Follow that because I'm gonna I'm gonna start uh, streaming and uploading uh, new Fire Pro Fed. So that's you specifically. Yes, that is me. Okay, great. So go follow Wrestleism right now. And uh, but thank you all for listening. Hope you all enjoyed the show, and we'll talk to you again in seven days. Bye.